Cool, so we're 77 pieces. Basically, what I'm gonna start by saying is the function of computer software is evolving very fast. In fact, what we call a computer is actually changing very rapidly. It used to be something that existed in a room, then it was something that was on your desktop. Now, basically, we all have one in our back pocket. <clears throat> and everything that's important about computing is not gonna exist on the cloud. <clears throat> it's incredibly important, but it's not ex entirely where everything's at. It also doesn't matter, <clears throat> well, Moore's law, which is the number of transistors that can fit on a microchip, which basically correlates to like the speed of the microchip, <clears throat> that's also very important, but you know, it's not, it's not everything. <clears throat> and neither is how slim your iPhone is gonna get. Now if you think, <laughs> is it really more important to shave another quarter of a millimeter off the thickness of your iPhone? <clears throat> no, I, I say no. <clears throat> and so change, change is gonna happen and change is gonna come from somewhere that's unexpected but it's not, it's not new technology. <clears throat> so right now, whether you're working <clears throat> or whether you're gaming or playing or browsing or networking or learning on your computer, the computer, the way you use a computer right now is an incredibly introspective process. Basically, we all cumulatively take the knowledge that we have and we put it back into the computer and we've created all these different ways that we can get that knowledge back out, right? And so basically, some, one of you can put something on, an MP3 online, right? And I can download it and listen to it, that's great. <clears throat> you know, that's, um, but if you ask yourself, if you ask your computer, what have you done for me lately other than that, other than receiving data that someone has authored? <clears throat> basically, it's printed stuff for you and that's pretty much it. <clears throat> right, you've got, you've got pages back from your computer and that's been your user experience with your computer for most of your, prob of your life, most likely. <clears throat> now, that doesn't have to be the case. And I'm gonna show you, this. the next slide is two things that are gonna change the world. And these are the things that you weren't expecting. <clears throat> and they exist and they're actually pretty mature technologies. <clears throat> the first thing is a Z-Core 3D printer. A friend of mine found a Z-Core and if you've never seen a 3D printer, um, it's a, uh, <clears throat> It prints plastic, you can print metal, you know, you can do colors, you can basically print action figures and all sorts of interesting things. The next thing here is a, um, a Haas CNC machine and that cuts metal and, and, uh, and you know, anything else, it cuts stuff into shape. So you're gonna be able to manufacture things, you know, in the next 10 years. I, so what is 77 Pieces? We are a CAD PLM company, and most of you probably don't know what PLM is. It means Product Lifecycle Management. <clears throat> and, and that basically means just keeping track of all the stuff that goes into anything that you make. <clears throat> you know, bill of materials, all that kind of stuff. So, who am I? I'm Sebastian, the founder and co-founder and CEO. And I have an Academy Award for inventing most of the technology that we're actually gonna be discussing today. <clears throat> My business partner is Joe Turan, who is a professor of math at UCLA. And he just received a really prestigious award, which is the Young Investigator Award from the Office of Naval Research, or the ONR, in the US. And he gets called lots of things, like one of the top 20 scientists under the age of 40, one of the top 50 minds on the planet. And um, uh, Michael Hathornway, who is a product designer from Melbourne. And, um, uh, he makes things that you probably have or, or uh, someone you know probably does. <clears throat> so together, we've been published over 30 times in peer-reviewed journals. <clears throat> and we've been cited over 600 times by other authors in, in you know, peer-reviewed publications. <clears throat> so along the way, we've also used this technology to make a, a lot of movies. This, this, the technology we're talking about was born in film production. <clears throat> and so... Let's take, for example, a pair of pants. This is done in Adobe Illustrator. This is how actually people in the fashion world sell things. They'll sketch something up in, in Illustrator, and actually there are websites that actually sell Illustrator sketches. So even if you're a fashion designer, what you might actually do is go to a website, buy a base pattern there, <clears throat> and then kind of just adjust it a little bit. So. From our, our software basically allows you to create the manufacturing schematic. <clears throat> and so you can kind of see here, there's the legs and all the bits and pieces from the pockets and the strip that goes up here. But we kind of ask ourselves, kind of going back to this whole mass customization thing, and say you wanted to slap like a hip pocket on there, you could just go to a library of hip pockets, drag it, drop it, 
throw it on there, <clears throat> and you know it's going to work because it's a hip pocket you've designed before. Oh, and then, then we can render it photorealistically. So this is, a pair, this is that pair of pants rendered photorealistically. Um, and so we can kind of predict what, what shape this is actually going to be when you actually assemble it. So as a designer, that's pretty important. <clears throat> so take a, another example that we, um, that we did. This is kind of just this random sketch that I kind of did for like an industrial part. This might be an inflated shape, it might be a pneumatic shape. It doesn't really matter. It's kind of like a cylinder with an interior cutout cylinder. <clears throat> so from that, again, we um, were able to, you know, quickly generate a pattern for how that would be manufactured. <clears throat> and then we're able to uh, basically assemble, inflate, and predict the stress and strain on that, which you kind of see in that map that's up there. The, the color gradients indicate strain. So applications for this technology are really broadly horizontal. Everything from you know, kind of our origins in film production, <clears throat> which basically, well, anyway, our origins in film production, um, to fashion, to uh, kind of furniture and upholstery making, mm -hmm. to automotive, to aerospace, and architectural, architectural elements. Um, everything back to like a pair of like Chuck Taylor sneakers. <clears throat> so two key questions about 77 pieces. What problems are we solving? So, so in this space, there are there are lots of niche solutions. Like basically, there isn't a CAD program. There is no way to design. <clears throat> and the second question we get asked a lot is why now? And while we've used this technology to make a lot of movies, we couldn't actually take a real material and predict, yeah, that's gonna be the exact behavior that that material will make. And, and that level of, of kind of understanding is what you need for an engineering solution. And so over the course of the last 10 years, we've actually gone from our origins in film production to, to now basically being able to accurately predict what these flexible structures are, are going to do. In the future, when things can be customized, say I make a pair of jeans and I design them and I want to give them to you, and say the local jeans guy has gone and bought like a roll and plotter, not exactly like a super high tech piece of you know, equipment <clears throat> and a roll of denim. And you can just kind of print on the denim, then cut it out with a pair of scissors, sew it up, you know, and there are some jeans. It's not, not super high-tech stuff. <clears throat> you know, in fact, most high-end jeans right now come only in one length. So there's basically, you know, uh, you always get them altered anyway. But, but the interesting question is really, what, what is the IP <clears throat> around um, this pair of jeans that I've designed? The jeans have to be adjusted to fit every person who wants to wear them. And so it's not a technical issue in being able to actually design something and then give it to someone to be manufactured. That's pretty easy. <clears throat> the question is, how do you design something that lets me give you something that then you can change to fit your needs, but also exists within a design space that as the designer, I've said, you know, it can exist here, but if you change it too much, it's no longer my design. <clears throat> and so, as we're kind of doing this CAD stuff, one of the things that we want to do differently is kind of keep all these things in mind as we kind of look toward the future of what CAD will be. <clears throat> and so, we're, we're getting close to being done. We're, our beta release will come out um, in the next couple of months. And we're trying to secure funding here in Wellington. And <clears throat> What we'd really like to do is set up a pretty standard Silicon Valley type technology company operating from here in Wellington. So, you know, um, <clears throat> that's where we're heading with this. So, well, thank you very much.